and welcome to another video to teach you about the wonderful world of Latin. Today's video is talking about strategies for how to translate Latin into English. To help, let's look at a nice metaphor. Translating Latin is like completing a jigsaw puzzle. There are multiple strategies and there is no one strategy that allows you to solve all puzzles perfectly. Every puzzle is different just as every Latin sentence is different. You need to think through each sentence and each puzzle to solve it. You also need the determination to solve both. Since there is no perfect strategy for every Latin sentence, this video reminds you of several rules and tips to help you remember how to translate your sentences. There is also no right way to solve a puzzle. You can do it in many ways. Similarly, there is no right way to approach translating a sentence. You can approach puzzles and translating in a variety of ways and end up with the same correct translation and completed puzzle in the end. We can push this comparison even further. In order to translate a sentence, you need to understand both the meanings of the words and the word endings. You need to know your vocabulary, noun adjective endings, and your verb endings. The image on the puzzle is like your vocabulary. It doesn't matter if the image on the puzzle is a manuscript of Virgil's Aeneid, the Roman Forum, or Hadrian's Wall that separated the Roman province of Britannia from the land of the barbarians. The image guides you, but you cannot force the puzzle together purely based on the image. You need to use the tabs and the gaps in the puzzle pieces to put it together. These tabs and gaps are the word endings. They provide the underlying structure to hold the sentence together. So let's use this metaphor to talk about two strategies for translating a Latin sentence. When working on a puzzle, some people find all the border pieces and then work inwards. This process is similar to Latin students finding the verb in conjunctions. The number of verbs tells you how many clauses are in a Latin sentence. Since each clause requires a subject and a verb, and in Latin, both the subject and the verb can be found in a conjugated verb. Once you know how many clauses there are, you can use the punctuation marks and conjunctions to split the sentence into smaller clauses. This is helpful because you cannot steal words from one clause to translate another clause, well, except for a subject or verb that is not repeated in one of the nearby clauses. For example, let's look at the sentence Puella magnam iram nautarum videt et patrium conservat. There are two verbs here, videt and conservat, so there must be two clauses. The comma and the conjunction et help us determine where to separate the two clauses. We should not use iram to translate the second clause or patrium to translate the first one. This helps us arrive at our translation. The girl sees the great anger of the sailors, and she preserves the fatherland. Because the girl sees the great anger of the sailors is one independent clause, and she preserves the fatherland as a second independent clause, we know to keep them separate. Notice, too, how Puella is the, impl is the implied subject of the second clause. Without a new nominative word, we use this context clue to understand the subject to be Puella from the first clause. Another common strategy for completing puzzles is to connect pieces based on the images, to complete a recognizable image or shape and then proceed to fill out the puzzle. This, this process is most like reading a Latin sentence from left to right as they were originally written. If you use the vocabulary, word endings, and your knowledge of what words relate to each other in order to gradually develop your understanding of the Latin sentence. This understanding will unfold as you read and recognize the case and number of each noun and adjective and the person, number, tense, voice, and mood of each verb. Remember, the case of a noun and adjective indicate their role in the sentence. The nominative case means the word is the subject or predicate nominative. The genitive case means the noun possesses or describes another noun, or it is the whole of which something is the part. 
A dative noun is the indirect object. An accusative noun is the direct object of a verb or the object of a preposition. An ablative noun is the object of other prepositions or shows how, where, and when things in the sentence happen. Finally, evocative noun is the person or thing spoken to. The cases are like the tabs and gaps and puzzle pieces. As you connect pieces together and see how words relate to each other, the larger picture becomes clearer. As I said before, there are certain clues that help you recognize that certain words must go together. First, the nominative subject and the verb must have the same number. Second, since a genitive noun possesses or describes another noun, or it is the whole of which another noun is a part, a genitive noun must relate to another noun. It usually comes after the word it modifies or limits. Similarly, adjectives will usually follow the, no the noun they modify. Remember, an adjective modifies a noun only if they agree in gender, number, and case. An adverb may modify an adjective or a verb, but it tends to come before the word that it modifies. Finally, a preposition will almost always come before the ablative or accusative noun that is the object of the preposition. Use these patterns to guide your thoughts as you link the word puzzle pieces together in your translation. Let's see how these patterns play out in the sentence, Sine poeta, nauta sententias antiquas poetae, saipe amat. To help you follow along, I have parsed each word as, and provided all of the possibilities that each word could have. Nauta is nominative singular, and amat is singular, so nauta must be the subject. Notice that poetai could be nominative plural. However, it cannot be the subject because amat is singular. The noun sententias must be modified by the adjective antiquas because they agree in gender, number, and case. Feminine, accusative, plural. Notice how antiquas comes right after sententias. We also know more about the sententias because of the word poetai. Since it can be genitive, and since it follows the phrase sententias antiquas, we should understand it as a genitive word that modifies or limits sententias antiquas. It tells us who's the sententias antiquas are, the poets. Similarly, the adverb saipe precedes the verb amat that it modifies. Lastly, the preposition sine takes the ablative case. Conveniently, its object, poina, is right after the preposition. Together, these rules help us construct certain chunks or parts of the puzzle. The agree or the nauta amats, the sententias are antiquas and of the poeta. The amatin is happening saipe and sine poina. The only thing that remains is to put these together using our uses of cases. Once we do that, we know that, without penalty, the sailor often loves the ancient thoughts of the poet. There is one last thing to keep in mind when you translate sentences, and we need a new analogy to help make this point. Let's use the same sentence as an example. If we translate the chunks in the same order as the Latin sentence, we get, without penalty, the sailor, ancient thoughts of the poet often loves. Yes, yes, that very nice sounds, but Yoda am I. And you are not Yoda. The typical Latin word order and Yoda's common word order is subject, object, verb. The typical English word order is subject, verb, object. Therefore, since you are translating sentences into English, English word order you use. Yoda, you are not. Indeed, the translation. Without penalty, the sailor often loves the ancient thoughts of the poet sounds much better to our ears than without penalty, the sailor ancient thoughts of the poet often loves.
and that is another clue for translating. If it does not sound right to you, you should go back and look for mistakes in your translation.